Hey, good morning, everybody. Great to see all of you. Thanks for being here, all of you in person. Thanks for being with us, all of you who are joining us online. It's a great, great joy to welcome all of you. If you've got a Bible, let me hear your pages turning to the Gospel of John and the 10th chapter. And this weekend, we do continue our special message series called I Am Jesus, What We're Doing is we're spending several weeks looking at seven specific statements Jesus made in the Gospel of John that all begin with the words, I am. And as we talked about in the intro to this, mes- this message series a couple of weeks ago, when Jesus says, I am, he's telling us his name. That is the name God gave to Moses when Moses said, who am I to tell the people of Israel that you are? the bondage, the people in bondage in Egypt. He wanted Moses to go and to lead them out of bondage. He said, well, who, who will I say sent me? And God said, tell them, I am, I am. And so this is a significant, significant study because it's basically Jesus telling us who he is in his own words. We began a couple of weeks ago in John chapter 6, and I shared a message called, I am the bread of life. Last weekend, our children's pastor, Chris Franklin, was in John chapter 8, and he shared a message called, I am the light of the world. And we find ourselves in John chapter 10 this weekend, and we're going to talk about this statement. It's probably the least known and the least understood. Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep. We're actually going to have a couple of different messages in this series from John chapter 10 because Jesus also says in this chapter, I am the good shepherd. But we're going to begin with this idea trying to understand what Jesus means when he says, I am the gate. One of the most fundamental truths the Bible teaches us about God is that he is a God of love. And one of the great blessings of putting this message together this week was spending time looking at so many different passages that talked about the love of God. Passages like Psalm 86:15, where we read, But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. And here it is, abounding. I love that. Abounding in love and faithfulness. Psalm 136 and verse 26 says, Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Now, we'll leave that up there for a moment because the way this is written in the Bible is actually as a responsive reading. And so we're going to do it again. And I'm going to read the first part. I'm going to say, Give thanks to the God of heaven, and then all of you together are going to respond by saying his love endures forever. We only have time to do this once, so don't mess it up. It's just a one take, one take Sunday, okay? Here we go. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Somebody say amen to that. How about uh, one of our most familiar and well-known verses in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. <clears throat> but have eternal life. <clears throat> I love Paul's powerful words in Romans chapter 8 and verses 36, or excuse me, verse 38 through 39. He says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We could literally spend all the rest of our time looking at verses like this, so I'm going to stop right there. God is the God of love. But the Bible doesn't just tell us about the love of God in verses like the ones we just read. It also gives us a number of word pictures about God that show us that he is a God of love. And one of the most precious, one of the most beautiful is the picture of God as a shepherd a shepherd who cares for his sheep, a shepherd who protects his sheep, which is what the Bible says you and I are. In Psalm 100 and verse 3, we read, know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us. And then it says, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. That's who we are. And if you spent any time in church at all, you're familiar with this word picture, this imagery of God as a shepherd. But what I need us all to do this morning is to try to understand this on a deeper level because since all of us are sheep, we desperately need a shepherd and there is no shepherd like God. Think for a minute with me about David's most well-known psalm, the 23rd Psalm. I'm going to put it up on the screen. I'm going to put it up on the screen in the King James Version because that's how I learned it when I was like nine or 10 years old as a little boy at Sunset Bible Camp. Doesn't that sound like a perfect place to go in the summer? Sunset Bible Camp. 
So I want you to read this with me. Let me hear your voices. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We just sang about that, didn't we? Your goodness is running after me. That's what, that's, that's, a, that's a reflection of who God is as our shepherd. There's never been a shepherd like God. And since Jesus was God in human flesh, we have the opportunity to see and understand the reality of God as a shepherd on a deeper and more personal level. In two I am statements in John chapter 10, we're going to look at the first one here. And so if you've got your Bible open to John 10 this morning and you're able, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of the scripture. I'm going to read John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Jesus is speaking. He says, I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will, go, he will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. All right, there it is. You can be seated. We always ask that God would bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let me tell you, right off the bat, folks, this is not the easiest message to deliver because while we just looked at the first 10 verses of John chapter 10, you have to go all the way back to the beginning of John chapter 9 for any of this to make sense. And so that's what we're going to do. I hope you got your Bibles out and open and your fingers are nimble and ready because we're going to have to look, we're going to have to, we're going to get to look at a lot of Bible verses this morning. I'm going to divide all this up into three major points. And so if you're someone who likes to take notes, the first thing you need to write down, number one, is a controversy. A controversy. And that takes us back to John 9. See, uh, here's what we have in our Bibles. We have the books of the Bible divided up into chapters, but they weren't written that way originally. And so at some point, somebody decided this should be where chapter one ends and this should be where chapter two ends and on and on and on. Well, honestly, where chapter nine ends and chapter 10 begins is, is, is not any kind of a break or division in what we're reading about because chapter nine just flows into chapter 10. And what you have in chapter 10 is the same day as chapter nine, the same scene as chapter nine, the same people as chapter nine, and the same event as chapter nine. And what happens in chapter 9, if you're not familiar, is Jesus heals a man, supernaturally heals a man who had been born blind. This man was a beggar because that's the only option a blind man had to try to survive in Jesus' day. In fact, I'm going to put the first five verses of John chapter 9 up on the screen and we'll look at them together. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work while I am in the world. And this is what Chris Franklin talked about last week. I am the light of the world. Now, we don't have time to go into detail on this, but I've told you before that in Jesus' day, there was no compassion for people who had handicaps because of the belief that if you had some kind of a handicap, like you were born blind, it was because of some sin in your life or your parents' lives. That's why the disciples asked the question that they did in John chapter 9 and verse 2, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? They just assumed this was something he deserved. 
But remember, I told you, if you were here a couple of weeks ago when we introduced this series by talking about Jesus being the bread of life, I told you that Jesus was the master of the teachable moment. He, he just had this, this opportunity to take uh, ordinary moments and turn it, well, it's not an ordinary moment when somebody's supernaturally healed, but moments in life and turn them into really teachable moments. And so that's what he does here. And in an act of great mercy and great power, he gives sight to this blind man and provides an unforgettable <clears throat> experience for all of his disciples. How did he do it? Well, it's kind of gross. He spit on the ground. <clears throat> Jesus was a spitter. And uh, he made mud with a spit. Some people just seem to have more saliva in their mouth than others. I don't know what the deal is. He made mud with a spit. He put the mud on the blind man's eyes and told him to go wash his eyes off in the pool of Siloam. If you've been with me to the Holy Land, we've been to the pool of Siloam. And uh, when he did, he, he washed his eyes off. He, he, he could see. It was just incredible, this incredible supernatural miracle. And when he did, he returned home. When he returned home, his neighbor saw him and said, wait, wait a minute, what's going on? This is the man born blind. This was the beggar. This is the guy uh, that has never been able to see. And they wanted to know an explanation, but they didn't like his explanation. He told them the story of how Jesus healed him, him, the details. But they didn't think that was a good enough explanation. So what they did <clears throat> is they took him to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, because they thought the religious leaders, if they got involved, might give them a better explanation. But when the religious leaders got involved, this is where the story begins to really go south because they did not want to accept this man's explanation for his healing because they did not want to accept Jesus. And in the end, what they did is they responded to this man who had been born blind, who Jesus had healed with ridicule and contempt. And they did that because of their hatred and rejection of Jesus. In fact, we're going to fast forward all the way down to John chapter 9 and verse 24. And we're going to look at uh, what, how the chapter ends. And I know we're picking this up in the middle of the story, but uh, time doesn't allow me to do any more. This is the uh, Pharisees talking to the man who had been born blind. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. That's they're talking about Jesus. I love his response. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Somebody say amen to that. I mean, how about that? He says, listen, I don't have any other explanation for you. All I know is I woke up this morning blind and now I can see. That's it. I'm done. I'm out. That's what he's saying. And I love that. I just love that. And then he goes on to say, <clears throat> or, th or rather they go on, then they ask him, this is verse 26, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? This, this question has already been asked and answered. He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? I love that. And here's the response of the religious leaders. Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. And friends, when it says he threw him out, that means they threw him out of the synagogue. It's an incredible story. And John chapter 9 is a powerful passage of scripture that reveals so much spiritual truth. But we don't have time to talk about that because we got to get to John chapter 10. And we got to understand the first 10 verses, but it's all connected. But before we get to John chapter 10, there is something that I do want to pause here and talk about for just a moment. <clears throat> I want to pause here in John chapter 9 just long enough to talk about the unbelief of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, because the neighbors of this man who had been born blind and Jesus healed brought him to the Pharisees because they thought the Pharisees might be able to give them, the religious leaders might be able to give them some better explanation of how all this happened. But all they found with the Pharisees is unbelief. And when you look at this story, you see some characteristics of unbelief that were true of the Pharisees, but they are also characteristics of unbelief that are often true of the people that you and I know in our lives who refuse to believe in God and who refuse to believe that Jesus was the Son of God, the, that he was God in human flesh. And this is so sad uh, for uh, 
uh, the Jews because the Jews were God's chosen people. That's what the Bible tells us, his special people. They were in line to experience incredible spiritual blessings as a result of the coming of the Messiah, and that's who Jesus was. But they missed all the blessing because of their unbelief. And their unbelief was so strong that here in John chapter 9, even though a supernatural healing of God had taken place, there's no other way you can explain it. As a result of Jesus' ministry, they weren't swayed. It didn't cause them to believe in Jesus in one single way. And so, um, there are some characteristics of unbelief we see in these Pharisees, these religious leaders, that we also see in people today. I'm going to do this real quick, so you might want to write them down somewhere. And the first one is this. Oftentimes, people who refuse to believe in God are inflexible. They're inflexible. In other words, when you get into a discussion with them, they're, they're, not, they're not there with a genuine desire to hear what you have to say because it might, it might move them somehow. They're oftentimes inflexible. When the neighbors of this blind man uh, took him to the Pharisees because they wanted a better explanation for his healing than what they had received from him, <clears throat> what happened is the Pharisees, uh, when they heard about this, uh, got caught up in the fact that Jesus, and we hadn't even gotten a chance to talk about this yet, Jesus performed this miracle on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. And Jesus did that a lot in the, in the Gospels, and there was a reason why. We don't have time to talk about it. <clears throat> but he performed this miracle on the Sabbath, which is a day that the Ten Commandments uh, said was to be a day of rest where there was no work that was to take place. But because Jesus did this on the day of Sabbath, on the Sabbath day, they immediately decided he was not from God because he broke the Sabbath command. They, they thought Jesus spitting on the ground, making mud with, uh, with his spit and the dirt, rubbing it on the man's eyes and instructing him to go to the pool of Siloam and wash constituted work. And so in their minds, there's no way, there was simply no way that someone who was from God would break the Sabbath. So they were inflexible. Uh, they, they couldn't deny that the man had been healed, but they would not believe that it was because of Jesus, because Jesus from God, because he didn't do it according to their rules. That's what it came down to. This can't be right. This man can't be from God, talking about Jesus, because what he has done doesn't fit into our rules. And here's what we understand when we talk to somebody about the reality of God. We're talking about a supernatural being. We're talking about the sovereign God of the universe. He's not going to operate by man-made rules. Somebody say amen to that. He's just not. But oftentimes, unbelief is just inflexible. Here's the second thing you see about them, uh, and you see in people today, sometimes unbelief is stubborn. Uh, John uh, 9, verses 18 and 19 uh, says, The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents, okay? So the guy giving his own testimony of what happened wasn't enough for them, so they sent for his parents. Is this your son, they ask? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? And so what we see here is with the evidence of Jesus' miracle standing right in front of them, staring them into their faces, the Pharisees remained unwillingly unconvinced, or excuse me, willingly unconvinced about this miracle that had been performed because they were just stubborn. They were just stubborn. We're just not going to believe it. And that's the way people who uh, are, are stuck in unbelief with regard to God are sometimes. It doesn't matter what you say or what you do. They're just not going to believe it. The third characteristic is they are foolish. Um, we read these uh, <clears throat> words a minute ago uh, from John chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And, and notice how this begins. A second time, see, they're foolish. A second time they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And so here's the deal. No matter how many times they hear the same story, they're simply not going to believe. And the longer they ask this man the same question over and over again and get the same answer over and over again, the more foolish they look. Here's the fourth thing about unbelief. Oftentimes, people who are steeped in unbelief, they're just not going to believe no matter what, are arrogant. They're arrogant. John chapter 9, verses 28 and 29 says, then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Then you skip down to verse 34, and it says, to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out of the, and they threw him out, out of the synagogue. We don't have time to talk about this in detail, but, you know, oftentimes people who are just steeped in unbelief in the end are just going to make it personal and they're just going to attack you because of their arrogance. And 
I guess another thing you could say is sometimes they're mean because that's what they were in this setting. Now, <clears throat> we, I wish we had time to talk about this more, but let me just kind of sum it up like this. And this might be hard for some of you to hear if you have somebody in your life that you really love and care about who doesn't believe and you think, well, I've got to find more evidence and we've got to have longer discussions. That may not be the case. When it comes to someone who refuses to believe in God or accept the truth that Jesus was God in human flesh, we often think we need to engage in more discussions and we have to have more evidence or better evidence. But sometimes, everyone say sometimes, sometimes the problem isn't in the discussion or the evidence, it's in the fact that the person you're dealing with has a sinful, prideful heart. A sinful, prideful heart. And over the past 40 plus years of my life, I've had lots of conversations with people who say they don't believe in God. And there have been times when I have had just to, I've just had to stop the conversation and say something like this. I don't think there's anything that I could say or that anyone else could say to you that will change your unbelief because clearly you don't want to believe. And that's just the reality for some people. Now, we might think, well, why would, not, why would somebody not want to believe in God? Well, it's not that complicated. The reason is because of their sinful pride. A lot of people want to run their own lives. and They don't want anyone, especially God, telling them how to live. They want to be in control. Think about the Pharisees in our story. They were comfortable in the life that they had crafted for themselves as religious legalists. And they didn't want to believe in Jesus because that would have changed everything about their life. And so sometimes it's easy for people, even people that we really love and care about, to make us think that their unbelief is about their intellect or about their interest in a more rational argument when it's really about their sinful, prideful heart. So that's the controversy. <sighs> right down next to number two, the second thing. And now we're going to make it into John chapter 10. I really should have assigned this message to somebody when I'm not in the pulpit because it's so much easier for me to just let them do it. But here we go. <laughs> Write down a contrast. That's number two. Because when we get to John chapter 10 and all this is unfolded with this man who had been born blind and these religious leaders who refused to accept his explanation and refused to give any acknowledgement or credit to Jesus. What happens next is Jesus in the first 10 verses of John chapter 10 contrasts himself as a true shepherd with the false shepherds who were the religious leaders of the Israelites, of the Jews. But before we talk about that, we've got to do one more thing in John chapter 9. We've got to look at verse 35 to the end of the chapter. It's not very long. This is right after the Pharisees threw this blindness, formerly blind man, out of the synagogue. Jesus heard that, he had been, that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? I love the honesty of this man. Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. He has no idea who Jesus is. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And then begins the contrast between Jesus as the good shepherd, the genuine shepherd, the real shepherd, and these false shepherds who were the religious leaders. And so... I love it when you get to John chapter 10 and Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Now, that's the way it reads in my NIV Bible. I would be curious here if anyone has an older translation where verse 1 of chapter 10 begins like this, Jesus said, truly, truly. I love it when I read my older translation Bibles when Jesus says truly, truly. Because anytime you are reading, uh, reading a Bible and Jesus says that, then just make a mark there because Jesus is about to say something really powerful and really significant. 
And what he says here is the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. And then in verse two, he says, the man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. Now, this is Jesus saying, hey, bottom line, there's a big difference between you and me, you being the religious leaders, you and me, you're false shepherds. And Jesus even goes so far as to call them thieves and robbers. And he says, but I am the true shepherd. I am the true shepherd. And let me tell you why we know that Jesus is the true shepherd. Let me begin by just explaining what he means by this idea of the, the sheep pen or the, uh, what is, would commonly be called a sheep fold. Um, in, the, in the life of a shepherd in ancient days was pretty rigorous. And they spent a lot of time with their sheep. Some of you have been with me to the Holy Land. We've been to the shepherd's field and we've seen the landscape where the shepherd would watch over their sheep. And, and it's rough. It's difficult. And, they, and sheep are dumb. Sheep are stupid. That's why you and I are sheep. That's what the Bible calls us. And, and it was a tough job. And it, 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 it took a lot of energy all day long. But when evening would come, then all the shepherds in the shepherding regions of, or region rather of Palestine would bring their sheep back to a village and uh, in the village they would have what was called a sheep pen or a sheep fold which is where the sheep were kept at night it could be an open air pen you know maybe just a like a think about a big circle that was was lined by a, a wall of, of rocks for example there'd be one entrance or one out it could be an open air shelter like that or it could be even a little bit more sophisticated than that but every evening the shepherds would bring their sheep back and here's the thing about these sheep folds or these sheep pens they were communal it wasn't just like this was this was the Jones sheep fold and this was the uh, the brown sheep fold or whatever it were communal all the shepherds would put their sheep in this same sheep fold and so they would come back to the to the village where they were from and they every night would put their sheep into the sheep fold but here's what would happen the shepherds would stop at the at the gate the door to the sheep fold and one by one with their rod they would they would put in front of the sheep one by one they would stop each sheep before it went in and they would do a careful inspection of each sheep I mean from head to toe front to back they would check him all uh, check the sheep completely to see if there was any wound or anything uh, that had happened that would cause them discomfort if they were acting different and it was a dirty job it was a messy job it was a time-consuming job but every night they did the same thing they carefully inspected each one of the sheep before they let the sheep go into the sheep fold and then once they were in the sheep fold they became under the care of what my NIV Bible calls in John chapter 10 and verse 3, the watchman who would be there to watch over the sheep in the sheepfold by night. And the shepherds could get a chance to get some food and get some rest before their day began again in the morning. And there was always only one way in the sheepfold and only one way out of the sheepfold. And the only person who had access to the sheepfold was the shepherd, the shepherd of the sheep. If someone else wanted to to get into the sheepfold, like to use Jesus' words, a thief or a robber, then they have to find some other way to get in. But Jesus goes on to say, and we'll look at this in just a moment, that if someone got in, even if somebody got in like a sheep, like a thief or a robber, the sheep wouldn't follow them because they were a stranger. In fact, Jesus says that not only would the sheep not follow them because they were a stranger, they would also run from them because they didn't recognize the stranger, the thief, the robber's voice. They only recognized the voice of the shepherd. But in contrast to that, while the sheep would have a lot of fear with a thief or a robber, they would have no fear of the shepherd. How could they ever fear someone who took such good care of them? Look at verses 3 and 4, John chapter 10. John, Jesus says, the watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And that's not like Bob the sheep or Ralph the sheep or even Sean the sheep. <laughs> they would name the sheep the way we might name a dog, you know, like, like, like Blackie or, 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 or if they had some kind of a funny idiosyncrasy about the way they looked or the way they acted, then they would give them a name like that. And so he says, the watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep, listen, listen to his voice when he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse four, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. 
But then again, in verse 5, it says, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. How could a sheep be a ever be afraid of someone who loved them and cared for them like that. And add to that, you know, the daily ritual of the inspection that the shepherd would do for each sheep. And you see this clear relationship, as odd as it sounds, this clear, almost personal relationship connection between the shepherd and each one of his sheep. Well, Jesus is trying to communicate something to these religious leaders And so in verse 6, we read this, Jesus used this figure of speech, him as a true shepherd and them as false shepherds, thieves and robbers. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. There's a communication problem here. And so Jesus just cuts to the core in verses 7 through 10. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. I'm the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I am the gate for the sheep. And so we see a little bit of a shift in the text because in the first five verses of John 10, Jesus, he doesn't come right out and say it like he's going to later. And we'll talk about this next week. But there's a shift between him describing himself or presenting himself as a shepherd to now saying, I am the gate for the sheep. And if you want to understand exactly what that means, then I'm going to make it really simple. This I am statement is Jesus saying, I am the entrance, I am the door, I am the gate, I am the way to the life you need, to the life you want, and to the life you have always longed for. That's what he's saying. And so in a very real way, this I am statement is very much like one that we're going to look at later in the series in John chapter 14, where Jesus says in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, I'm the way. I'm the door. I'm the entrance. I'm what you've been looking for and longing for when it comes to life. Right down next to number three, a conclusion. So we've seen a controversy, a contrast. Let's talk about a conclusion. Let's try to pull all this together. And to do that, you got to go back to the story of Jesus healing this blind man. Because here, here, here's, here's the bottom line of going through all of this, this, going through all the controversy and going through the, uh, the contrast. These Pharisees in John chapter 9, these religious leaders in John chapter 9, listen to me close, were supposed to be the shepherds of the people of Israel. But instead of caring for them the way a shepherd cares for his sheep, instead of pointing them to a genuine spiritual life with God or a safe, protected, peaceful life, they did just the opposite. And the evidence of that is seen in the way they responded to this man who had been born blind that Jesus healed. So Jesus heals a blind man supernaturally in an unforgettable way. When his neighbors see him, they don't know what to make of this, so they took him to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, these false shepherds, for an explanation. And they rejected this man's explanation for his healing because they said Jesus was a sinner because he performed the miracle on the Sabbath. And so what happens is in spite of irrefutable evidence of a miracle standing right there in front of them, and in spite of an unchanging explanation, every time they ask him for what happened, They continued to look for a different explanation because they did not want to give any credit to Jesus at all. And finally, when they asked this man one more time how Jesus caused him to see, his frustration comes out. In that verse we've already read twice, we'll read again, John 9, 27. He he answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They got so mad at that response that they hurled insults at him and they kicked him out of the synagogue. They threw him out of the synagogue. These men who were supposed to be the shepherds of the people of Israel kicked this man out of the synagogue. They made it harder for him to get to God than easier. What should they have done? They should have thrown a party. A man who was born blind can now see. But all they did was ridicule him, and all they did was insult him, and all they did was throw him out of the synagogue because they weren't willing to give any credit or belief to Jesus at all. 
And so Jesus, taking all this in, says, you know what? You're just false shepherds. You are thieves and you are robbers. I'm the true shepherd. And I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the entrance to the life that you've always wanted and the life that you've always longed for. And that's why he said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. So let me just ask you a question this morning and we'll get ready to close. <clears throat> How's your life today? If you were to describe your life in 20 words or less, what words would you use? I mean, really be honest. My life is great. My life stinks. My life is exciting. My life is dull. My life is full. My life is empty. My life is completely satisfying. My life, every day of my life, I have this overwhelming sense that something's missing. What would you write? In the, mo in the most honest moment, what would you write? about your life. I sat at my desk this week and I tried to write down single words that describe the life that Jesus offers. And as I thought about everything in John chapter nine and the first 10 verses of John chapter 10, and I wrote down several words, all of them started with a P. That's how my mind thinks. Personal, a shepherd has personal knowledge of his sheep. God has personal knowledge of you, Jesus wants to make that even more personal when you give your heart to him. Protected. A shepherd protected the sheep. Jesus wants to protect you in your life. That doesn't mean that you're not gonna have any hardship or trouble in your life. We all know that's not true. Jesus said just the opposite of that. He said, uh, in this world you will have trouble. Literally, he said, in this world you will have trouble in John chapter 16 and verse 33. But then he said, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And so there is a protection. It's just not a protection we sometimes immediately see in the moment. I wrote down powerful. Who's more powerful than him? Who's more powerful than someone who can heal a man born blind in just this really unusual way? Who's more powerful than Jesus who is the good shepherd? Peaceful. Is your life peaceful today? You feel a deep and abiding peace deep down in your soul no matter what happens around you today. Even when you face the questions of life that don't make sense. And I wrote down plenty. Because Jesus talked about life that is a life that's full that's abundant, that's plenty. One last thing before we close. When Jesus was contrasting the Pharisees who were false shepherds to himself as the good shepherd, in John chapter 10, he talked about the truth that the shepherd would lead his sheep. And he talked about in John chapter four about how the shepherd would go ahead of his sheep. And this is the image of the picture that I want us to, to end with today of Jesus as this shepherd. You know, we think in, in the Western world that we live in today, the modern Western world, shepherds don't lead sheep. They drive sheep from behind. But Jesus is always out in front. He's always leading. That's what he wants to do in your life and mine. And when I first was beginning to write this message, I got this song stuck in my head based on that image, probably drove my wife crazy singing and humming it all the week long. But how many of you remember the old hymn that we used to sing? Some of you are old enough, some of you are not probably old enough, that's okay. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, Tis still God's hand that leadeth me. And then the chorus would go, He leadeth me, he leadeth me. By his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be.
for by his hand he leadeth me. But it's the last verse of the song that I've always loved the most. <clears throat> because it reminds us that he doesn't just lead us during our time here in this world. He's going to lead us, if we belong to him, into a new world that will be eternal. You remember how the last verse goes? And when my task on earth is done, when by God's hand the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. How's your life today? That's the question. Because God has a life like you never imagined.